So my name is Mani Bikanda. I am a midwife and also I teach at Ryerson in the midwifery education program. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of these refugee health cuts on pregnant women and give you a few kind of real life stories of and try to put some faces to these cuts and what they might look like. So previously, as Meb explained, um, with the interim federal health plan, anyone who is a refugee claimant or a government-assisted refugee or a sponsored refugee had full coverage. So what that meant in pregnancy is that all lab work, so blood work, swabs, or analysis, all ultrasounds, all genetic testing, all high-risk issues. So if someone had something very um, unusual on an ultrasound and we needed to refer someone to Mount Sinai to the special pregnancy unit, for example, um, if someone needed genetic consultation for an anomaly, all facility fees, so that refers to hospital fees, um, and labor. So in labor, if a woman needed a consultation for an obstetrician, if she needed an emergency cesarean, an epidural, um, the cost of, to the OB, to the anesthetist, to the doctor who comes to assist, if there's a complication in the surgery, so if a second anesthesiologist has to come in or a urologist, um, all of those would be covered and all medication would be covered. So for hypertension, diabetes, antibiotics for urinary tract infection, breast infection, hypothyroid. Um, with these changes now, as uh, Meb also explained, there are gonna be three categories of people under, under the IFH changes. The first are GARS and um, sponsored refugees aren't covered, no. So just government assisted refugees, they'll still have the same kind of coverage that they did have. And really, uh, like Mel, I really believe it was a government response to a very, very loud and clear healthcare voice that made them rescind on that, even though they're saying they haven't rescinded. Um, the second will be people who have partial coverage. So those are the non-DCO countries. I always get confused about DCO and non-DCO. Those are the non-DCO coverage. And then the DCO, oh, I put non-DCO DCO twice, ignore that. Then the DCO countries will be people who have no coverage. So just to give you an idea of, um, I work at, in this corridor of the city. So Rexdale, North Etobicoke, um, very high immigrant communities. There are very few GARs, or government assisted refugees that we see. And a lot of the people we see who are refugee claimants are from the Caribbean and Latin America. Just in terms of global health issues, to put it a little bit in perspective, right now Latin America has the highest cesarean sexual rates in the world. So what it will also mean for these women who are coming in, I, I really, I'd like to be able to give you some numbers, but I can't remember the last time I saw a woman from Latin America who had had one child that wasn't born by cesarean. So if they've had their kid in Latin America, from the clients that I see, they've all had cesarean sections. Um, and so for women, that kind of raises the stakes in terms of complications for your next pregnancy. And for women who don't have any access to insurance now, it leaves them in the situation of trying to have a vaginal birth after cesarean, which is great, actually, and very well supported in the research. But it's the kind of thing you should only do if you believe that you would rather have vaginal birth. It shouldn't be necessarily a risk that you take based on cost. And it's not appropriate for all women. Some women are going to be higher risk. Um, so, and it's likely, as Meb was saying, that we do think that most of Caribbean and Latin America will be on the DCO list. So just to give you an idea of what pregnancy looks like with partial coverage. So these are the people who will still have some coverage, but are not government-assisted refugees. They won't have any drug coverage anymore. And in pregnancy, that can actually be quite severe. So if a woman who's diabetic or hypertensive, or both, and they often go hand in hand, one is we know that um, complications such as hypertension and preeclampsia, which is a, a rare but very serious disorder in pregnancy, they're higher with people of different ethnicities. So people of, of African origin are, have much higher rates of preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders. And um, same with women living in poverty. And in Toronto, well, usually that goes hand in hand. So um, the consequences of a woman, just giving you the example of hypertension, so I'm not even getting into the other complications. 
if they don't have access to medication is very high rates of prematurity and low birth weight. And low birth weight and prematurity in the world of obstetrics is actually one of the most severe consequences of pregnancy and can have lifelong consequences for the baby. Um, I don't know the exact stats now, but I know about seven or eight years ago, the second highest expenditure in healthcare in Canada was on premature infants. So really, the potential for, and this part of why I'm stressing this is because the, one of the biggest arguments about this being cost savings to the Canadian medical system is um, just looking at pregnancy alone. I, I just can't imagine that that's true. Um, in terms, and I'm not even, when I talk about the cost effects to premature <coughs> infants in the Canadian healthcare system, I'm talking about the immediate neonatal ICU care. I'm not talking about long-term occupational therapy, physical therapy, cognitive disorders, ADHD, the list really goes on and on. And then the effects to a mother of having hypertension in pregnancy can be really severe. Hypertension is still one of the leading causes of maternal death. And Canada, so maternal death is quite low in Canada, but this is one of the highest reasons it can happen. And women can have seizures, strokes, kidney damage, heart damage. Getting blood pressure in, under control in pregnancy has a huge impact on the outcome for the mother and the child. And just um, to also put this a little bit into context, this woman now, who, if she has seizures and on ongoing kidney damage, heart damage, is not going to have access to medication for those ongoing issues also. What does, um, and that's kind of the good story, it's probably those are women who are on the non-DCO list and we don't think the majority of them will fall into that category, but those are kind of the lucky ones in these changes. Um, pregnancy with no coverage, to give you an idea of what it looks like, and a huge, um, I shouldn't say huge, but a significant percentage of the women that I care for are women who have no insurance. So I, in a very real way, see out there interprofessionally what it looks like, what the consequences of pregnancy look like, and really the, the DCO list, it will be essentially women who don't have any coverage. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like in pregnancy, um, the immediate effect will be hundreds, maybe thousands, we don't know the exact number. My guess is probably close to the thousands in the Toronto area alone. Uh, women who are already pregnant, who will all of a sudden, like one of the big fears of the DCO list coming out is this list is gonna come out, a whole bunch of women will already be pregnant, have, <laughs> won't have applied before June 30th, and then they'll be left with no care. The realities of what it costs for pregnancy care if you're uninsured in Toronto right now, most obstetricians take somewhere between $3,000 and $4,000 as a retainer fee, so they won't see you once unless you give them three or $4,000. Usually in cash, they're not going to take a check. Most of them don't have visa ability. Um, and that's, that's to cover the cost of anything that can happen obstetrically, so to make sure that they're still going to get paid. Um, and I, anecdotally, over the last decade of practice, have really noticed obstetricians getting more and more tight-fisted about this. And I actually do believe it's a reaction to seeing so many uninsured women who walk in and they don't get paid for them. That it's, I mean, there's not a systemic approach, but it's resulting in more and more obstetricians at the door saying, I'm just not going to see anybody. Because when I'm on call at the hospital, three women are going to show up, I'm going to have to deal with that anyway. It's a bit short-sighted because if you don't see that woman and she has a complication and you end up being on call at the hospital when she shows up, you are dealing with it anyway, but there's a bit of a, I'm just going to bury my head in the stand, maybe I won't be the one on call, maybe someone else will be on call. Um, so that's about three or $4,000. Hospital fees, and it's a bit of a free-for-all right now, the Toronto Central Lid is trying to come, have hospitals come to some sort of agreement about what they'll charge. But it's anywhere between $500 a night, which is really low balling it, and it's only one hospital I know of that will charge that after a lot of negotiation, to $2,600 a night. And that's a low risk of obstetrical unit. Um, routine lab work is about $500, and that's not including if you need an amniocentesis, if you need um, extra ultrasounds, if you have a hospital ultrasound, for example, at Etobicoke General, every single time you walk in the door, you also pay $150 admin fee for the blue card, I think, that they 
print out and then you go two days later and you pay another $150 admin fee for the same blue card. I'm not really sure what the rationale is for that, but just to give you an idea of how it works. So really a low risk, normal, straightforward pregnancy. A woman is looking at paying somewhere between five and six thousand dollars. If a woman has a high risk pregnancy, that rate can skyrocket to twenty thousand, thirty thousand, depending on how long she needs to stay in hospital, depending on how many people get involved, if she has a very complicated surgery, one day in ICU can cost upwards of $8,000. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea. So, and I'm just gonna talk about a few kind of real life cases. What's my time like? Okay, good. A few real life cases to give you an example. So this is in the threat of the DCO list coming out. It's not even after the DCO list has come out. So I had a client last month she was from the Caribbean, had a valid IFH card, and was told by her obstetrician she had to show up with $1,500 cash at her next visit. So she's 39 weeks pregnant, actually delivered in 39 weeks in two days. She's 39 weeks pregnant, due date is up in a week, and the OB says show up next week with $1,500 or don't come back. So she showed up to our clinic as a walk-in, and um, my administrator kind of begged me to see her because we were quite full and we couldn't, but this is what happens in healthcare. And I saw her IFH and it was valid. And so I called, my administrator called the obstetrician's office and said she has a valid interim federal health card. She should still be a patient. We can't really accommodate her. Basically, there were a lot of phone calls back and forth. They didn't care. Um, so we ended up caring for this woman. Just to give you an idea of her context, that, to me, she was like, how do I even have time to save for $1,500 in a week and to come up with cash? She was living in Ontario housing with a cousin um, between the two of them and their children and the other people who were staying there. They were as a family of eight in Ontario housing in a three bedroom apartment. There's no way she could have saved even half that money. And for me, I was left with this question of, was the OB just misinformed about the changes? And I think the point that Med made about how much more complicated it is now, that a lot of specialists are just like, I, I'm not dealing with this. I'm gonna close my door. Once I open my door, I'm medically, legally liable. Obstetricians in particular, I think are feeling a lot of strain because you can only put on pregnancy for so long. Eventually those babies come out. You can't just hope that you know, four years from now, something will develop into something serious. You know it, pretty limited in its time frame. And I think they're really seeing the strain of people walking in over and over and not getting paid and taking the medical legal risk for that. Um, was it that the obstetrician was concerned about the DCO list coming out? Which, you know, the chances of it coming out within that week are pretty low. Or was he actually just taking advantage of her and her vulnerability around the IFH? And I do worry about that. Like, had she given him the $1,500, would he have returned it to her? because her health care was valid, would he have still billed IFH? Um, it's hard to know. And then this is just kind of a case that I'm going to leave you guys with, but um, this is kind of a very real life story that we see. Um, so I had a client a few years ago who was a victim of torture. She was abducted by the police in retaliation for her family member's political involvement. She was from Sub-Saharan Africa. I don't want to name the country because it's, you know, I don't want to in any way put anyone at risk for any reason. Um, so she was raped and beaten for days, um, became pregnant as the result of the rape. Her family gathered funds and falsified documents for her to come here as the wife of a Canadian citizen. And the man who they paid, they didn't know anybody in Canada, but it was the only way to get her out of the country safely. The man that they paid was supposed to care for her until the end of the pregnancy. She didn't speak any English, and when they got to the airport, he took her bags and said, I'm going to get a taxi, I'll be back in a minute, and he never came back. So she's now left quite pregnant, 18 years old, doesn't speak English. A family actually kind of took pity on her, weeping in the corner of the airport, I think, and they took her home for the night and then dropped her to a shelter the next day. She ended up coming into my care, and she was a refugee claimant. Now, she might end up on a non-DCO country list if the same thing happened now. She did actually become hypertensive in her pregnancy, um, which is very high risk for a young woman. Um, so even if she was lucky enough to be on a non-DCO list, 
she would not have access to a medication today. And the last time I saw her, she said that her claim had been denied for refugee status because she didn't have any evidence. And she looked at me and she said, am I supposed to write the police and ask them to send me a letter saying that they raped me and that's why I'm pregnant? So she, I mean, last time I saw her, she was appealing the case, but interestingly, under these new laws and the way things have changed, she wouldn't have access to her medication. And, um, and really, she had nothing. Like, this man took every penny they had, all her clothes, um, she, she wouldn't have been able to come up with the money for her hypertensive medication. And under the new laws, she would actually um, be detained, potentially, for up to two years because she was involved with a human trafficker. Now, the other thing I want to add, the twist I want to add to that is, um, these kids are Canadian. So she would end up in jail and her Canadian child would end up in foster care or, and I think that's really, like the last point of the slide where it says Canadian babies, Canadian babies, Canadian babies. Part of why I'm always saying that, one is I think it's very compelling, but there's also a very bottom line dollar argument to all of this, which is that prenatal care is considered one of the most cost effective interventions in healthcare. And the cost of us not providing prenatal care to this very vulnerable population um, is I think it's going to be catastrophic and I think when the DCO list comes out for sure I'd say 98% of the women I see who are refugee claimants are from the Caribbean or Latin America I don't think they'll have coverage anymore and so I think this already growing group of uninsured that exists in our borders is going to skyrocket I don't think people are going to leave and I think the reality of global health disparity is that people are still going to come here and we'll just end up in this category